James Carr, you are running for Congress in the 7th Congressional District, is that correct? Yes, it is. And you're the Libertarian Party's nominee? Yes. Uh, what was your reaction to the Republican primary last Tuesday where Eric Cantor, the House Majority Leader, was defeated by David Bratt, who nobody had heard of before? Uh, well, actually, if you had been talking to voters in the district, it really wasn't that much of a surprise. As a matter of fact, my team and I have been planning for this outcome. We we split our time equally uh, between both outcome that Cantor wins and that Brat does. Uh, it's very hopeful, quite honestly, that the voters aren't just going to use name recognition and large dollars to win their vote over. I think more than anything, the voters stated that someone who outspends you 10 to 1 doesn't necessarily you know, win. Well, what do you think was the motivating factor, if there was one, or what, what were the multiple factors that fed into this kind of voter discontent that, that defeated Eric Cantor? I, th I think it's a lot of factors, and I think it's one that most of the media is, is getting incorrect, quite honestly. They seem to be focusing on one issue and saying that that was the reason for the win, and it really wasn't. It is the voters' dissatisfaction and the complete ineptitude in Washington right now in the idea of a permanent professional politician living in Washington, being disconnected from those that they're supposed to represent, no longer listening to those that they represent, no longer holding town hall meetings, connecting with the voters. They want someone who's going to do that. And they clearly didn't have that with Mr. Cantor. Mm -hmm. They said, we're going to get rid of him. And I know many people that I've talked to over the last several months when I've been out knocking on doors, going to farmer's markets, um, setting up events at brew fests, talking with voters, that most of them said, I'm going to show up just to vote Cantor out, and then we'll see what happens in the general election. And many of them are very open to a libertarian platform. Well, you've been spending a lot of time in the district talking to voters. What have you learned about David Bratt, this economics professor who you know, suddenly is on the national radar screen and bringing you along with him to a certain extent? Sure. Uh, well, you know, I, I tried to learn as much about David Bratt as I could from his website. Um, and he has some of his positions, but most of it is at a very high level and you're going to have to interpret quite a bit. And in talking with the voters, I found that to be one of their points of frustration. But they did, they were very clear saying, but I'd rather vote for someone that's not Cantor in the primary and then find out what the issues are later. So I really do believe that the, the focus on the one issue, which you know, the, all the media is covering his stance on immigration, and um, that that wasn't as important to most of the people that I talked to. You know, the, thousands of people that we had interactions with over the last several months. Uh, Since you're not running against the incumbent anymore, you have to change your strategy. And David Bratt has identified himself on many occasions as a libertarian. Uh, mm -hmm. And you are a libertarian with a big L, running as a libertarian party nominee. How does that change your approach to the issues that you emphasize on the campaign trail? It, it doesn't. It, it doesn't at all. Um, Dave Bratt, I don't think he's actually identified himself as a libertarian. I think the media has, because his campaign manager is a libertarian. Mm -hmm. um, Dave Bratt could be considered more of a slightly libertarian-leaning Republican on some issues, but on many not. He is, um, on the, the social issues, he's pretty well Republican, and I, I don't think anyone who looks into his website, listens to some of his speeches, would argue that Dave Bratt is a libertarian. Is he more libertarian than, say, Cantor? Probably. Um, but I, I would not make the mistake of calling Dave Bratt a libertarian. And there's also a Democrat in the race, uh, Jack Trammell, yes. sociologist from Randolph-Macon College. Yes. What do you know about him? Have you had a chance <laughs> to meet him yet? Haven't had a chance to meet him. Um, haven't found anything other than some of his academic work. Uh, 
that gives me any indication of his stances on the issues. He doesn't have a website up yet, so we're, we're at a point where um, and Mr. Trammell is kind of a question mark. Um, you know, kind of came into the race very late, late on, didn't have any indication that that was going to happen. And we're now trying to figure out, well, who is this person and how do we make clear that we're very different? I mean, I, I know, unless he's actually a libertarian running as a Democrat, that we're going to have some very different stances in certain areas. And um, I'd like to be able to address that to the voters very clearly, give them an accurate picture. Uh, I'm almost positive, giving the one interview that I've been able to f see with uh, Mr. Trammell and the interviews with David Bratt, that this is going to be a very new race for the voters. They're going to have positive messages. They're not going to have negative campaigning from here through November. Well, that, that's a good thing. And, and so my next question is about your background. What do you bring to the race that the other candidates don't? Well, um, they, they're both very intelligent academics. Um, I am, I, well, I consider myself rather intelligent just because well, there's a little bit of arrogance that has to exist for anyone to be healthy. Um, but I, I come from the defense industry. And I've been worked there for several years in cost control, cost management, contract management. I've been in the healthcare industry for about seven and a half years now and have some very uh, in-depth background and understanding on exactly how the government's involvement in healthcare has completely eroded the actual health care that people are getting from their providers in the end and has increased what people are paying. Uh, most people don't understand that the government drives most of true health care costs um, into consumer cost. Uh, I'm also, uh, Mr. Brad is an economics guy and I'm a finance guy and most people don't understand that those two disciplines are very different. Mm -hmm. um, but my work in healthcare is also on the analytics side. I'm a, a process improvement type person. Um, I, I look at the grand scheme. You know, here, here's the large picture, but you need to drill down into certain areas. And how do you do that efficiently? And how do you find ways to squeeze out the most for the least? That that has been my focus. You know, even when I was in the defense industry, and. What I want to offer is, let's put somebody into office who can find ways to do more efficiently the things that the government ought to, but also find ways to start pulling back the pieces that the government has assumed responsibility for that they were never intended to do. And show the voters, show the public that there are options for the government to stop performing certain things. They're going to cost you less in the long run and actually are going to be performed more effectively by you or by the private industry. So we're going to outline, outline a very clear path to success with less government. If you could make, wave a magic wand, what are the <laughs> three government programs or agencies that you would get rid of entirely? <laughs> yeah, uh, well... Besides Obamacare. Well, <laughs> Because that's the answer everybody gives. And everybody's going to give that one. Right. And you know what? I don't think that the public is quite ready to say, just get rid of it. I think that that's coming. I, I do think that there's, you see the writing on the wall. The public is not happy. The rollout was an absolute disaster. They rolled out a, an idea that was flawed to begin with. They rolled it out in a flawed manner. So everybody, of course, is going to jump onto that. But I'll tell you that first thing that I'd like to see is Department of Education. You know, and... That one, some people get really up in arms about, but the idea of this um, federal level control over education, of Common Core, is absolutely a uh, hideous approach to furthering real education. It, it becomes rote memorization that people are, you know, that teachers are teaching instead of true critical thinking. So you get rid of the Department of Education, or at least pull them back to uh, the most basic reporting agency. Those funds now you know, are not taken from taxpayers at the federal level. The states can decide how they handle education. Right now, the federal government controls how states handle education because they hold the dollars in their hand. Um, 
And I'll tell you, the, the two biggest areas in the federal government, the most, the most bloated sections, are the health and human services and defense, so militarization. We're not the world's police. There's significant opportunity to pull back the spending in the defense industry, bringing our folks back home, and providing better protections for us. Our security is not enhanced by having troops across seas fighting battles that are not ours to fight. Um, I also would, I would actually get rid of Medicare Social Security programs. And most people have a very uh, harsh initial reaction to that until they understand that I'm not saying you've paid into a program, we're getting rid of it and good luck that there has to be a very rational, stepwise approach to pulling these programs back. And it involves, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Harry Brown's approach that he outlined many years ago, and it is still very valid today. It's liquidation of federal level assets that the government was never meant to own, these large tracts of land. Like these, Nevada. <laughs> right, right. Um, there are buildings, there are and I can't remember the exact figure. It's obviously grown quite a bit now since uh, his plan was, you know, better than a decade and a half ago. But there are, it's probably close to trillions of dollars of federal assets that they should not own, that you liquidate. And you set up individualized plans so that if you've been paying into Social Security, Medicare for, say, 40 years, we're going to give you a personalized account. Now you can take that money and you can blow it on a, a vacation and you say, I'm not going to live for two years. Okay, that's your decision. Or you can take that account and you can take it to a private firm. By the way, the private firms outperform government investment 100% of the time. Um, it, you invest, invest that in the private firms or have someone help manage your account. You're going to do better off. In Texas, they, they allow people to opt out of Social Security, and they're getting, I think, a 9 to 1 payout compared to those that stayed with the federal Social Security program. Mm -hmm. So you're actually going to enhance lives. You're reducing what's being taken from people in taxes now, and you're getting rid of a program that has zero chance of maintaining itself in the next 10 years anyway. As you go door to door meeting with voters in the 7th District of Virginia, what questions are they asking you? <laughs> well, a, a lot of them, they want to hit on some of the big um, emotionally evocative issues. So I, I've been asked about my stance on immigration. I've been asked on my stance on abortion, on welfare, on gun control. Um, it's, it's really not just a one or two. There, there's this group, that have, uh, group of issues that have become sort of key in the media and everybody gets revved up because they're, um, the media has created these polarizing terms. You know, if you think about the abortion issue, um, pro-life or pro-choice, well, these, these terms are very emotionally evocative. Nobody wants to be anti-pro-choice and nobody wants to be anti-pro-life. Mm -hmm. So instead of taking a rational view, they're trying to get people's emotions keyed up to make them side with you know one group or another and I think when the voters start to really sit back and look at what impacts them and how they view things almost everyone is going to say I want less government control over my life and I want them to stop taking so much money out of my pocket that's kind of the key most distilled down libertarian platform that you get okay last question is how can people find out more about your campaign? Do you have a campaign website, Facebook? Uh, just tell us where you prefer to look. Well, they can go to jamescarforcongress.org. Um, I'm on Facebook, James Carr for Congress 2014. And my media director has uh, social sites set up that I didn't even know existed at times because, you know, we, we have a Twitter feed, we've got a Reddit account, we've got a YouTube page that we're still working on our, our videos to add to. But everything can be found at jamescarrforcongress.org, and the links to everything else are right there. Is that James Carr for digit four or uh, word sorry, four? yeah, F O R. Okay, spelled out correct. James Carr F O R. Or if, if you Google 
James Carr Congress, I'm going to be the first six or seven sites that come up. Okay. E even though there are some James Cars from Congress back in the 1800s. <laughs> Uh, was there one from Virginia? No, they're all Massachusetts, so... Oh, okay. Okay, well, thanks for your time today. Uh, good luck in the race. I hope, hope to see you debating uh, David Bratt and Jeff, uh, Jack Trammell at some point in the future. Yeah, I really look forward to it. I'm, I'm hoping they're willing to, to make this a nice, positive race where the voters get to hear what we each stand for and they don't have to watch negative ads for the next well, five Well, what you months. need to do is you need to go to... Uh, Randolph-Macon College and, and get, uh, get an invitation from the College Libertarians, give a speech there, and then you'll be in the, the center of the known universe. <laughs> I like the idea. I, I think my, uh, my campaign manager had mentioned that we need to make sure we get on campus there as soon as possible. We're probably going to wait till August when the kids are back on campus, but that is, that is definitely in the cards. Okay, well, thanks for your time today. Oh, I thank appreciate you. it. Thanks. Appreciate it.